and uh, really had no evidence of that whatsoever. There were some incidents that had taken place um, in which I had been stuck in different locations. There were incidents that had taken place with my timesheet, but I had never falsified anything. So once again, I was um, put in a position to kind of, you know, the fight or flight kicked in, and I chose to fight that as well. And um, some pretty scary events happened. I was threatened. I was intimidated. Um, it's kind of hard. I mean, I'm a rather large woman myself, but I've been in a few fights or two. But when a six foot two ex marine is really uh, belitter belittling you in public with his fist in your face and screaming at you this close to your face, telling you that you don't have a right to an attorney, you don't have a right to a hearing, you don't have a right to anything. The State Department holds your contract, the State Department is pulling your contract. That, that was really great because um, what he didn't know was I had my tape recorder running the whole time. And I was really hoping he'd punch me, but <laughs> he never did. <laughs> <laughs> but I did have nice witnesses standing around, so that was quite helpful as well. But I mean, it was the mentality. I mean, you can, you can kind of understand, I guess, I'd come from a, what I considered a very progressive police department in my hometown, even though we were from the Midwest, we were quite progressive. Um, we were the capital city. We, my chief of police had sent us all over the country in my early years to get us trained in, in different areas of the United States. And all the human trafficking and this type of crime of serious international organized crime wasn't something that we ever had to deal with outside of some drug trafficking and some immigration problems that we may have had, you know, from people jumping off the train from Mexico. But um, that was the extent of the international experience that any of us really had. And so not only was it what I saw then once coming to Bosnia was in no way, shape, or form are any of the international police at least who come from the United States and probably from other East European countries trained in these issues. Because I really felt that I came from one of the best departments in the country. And if our police weren't trained in these issues, then I knew nobody was. So for that to be happening and to be thrown into a mission where officers are expected to know not only these international laws, all about the Dayton agreements, we're given no training, we were given a week of training mm -hmm at the UN headquarters after we got into Bosnia. We were given no training about these issues before we left the United States. And these are issues on things that even didn't concern human trafficking. I mean, housing issues, how to you know, put displaced persons back in their homes that they lost, how to investigate refugee camps. Nothing, zero training was given to these officers. So that it all just was one big conglomeration of crap, I'm sorry, that we had to put up with, and then to expect us to go out and monitor the local police and teach them how to do their job in a country whose laws we didn't know, in a country where we were sent, in fact, none of us knew the international laws either of what we were actually supposed to be teaching them how to do, it became pretty clear that this really was just a scam in my eyes. The whole mission system itself was a scam. And I lost all respect, not only for this company, but started to lose respect and trust of my own government, the State Department, who was allowing this to happen. I started making mental notes and keeping mental and keeping physical notes of what I was going to tell my State Department and my congressmen and senators when I returned home. And that was really all before I ever got fired, before I, I really knew that DynCor was going to get rid of me the way they did. So once that happened, that really kind of added some more fuel to the fire. Um, so that's kind of where it ended up. I wound up uh, seeking advice after they terminated me. I fled the country. I was warned by my fellow IPTF officers who I did trust, who weren't Americans, that um, my life was really in danger. They feared that my house had been bugged. Um, I was preparing and packing to leave, and they came and took me to their home and kept me there overnight, um, and then made sure I got out of the country the next day in, in daylight. So it was kind of a harrowing experience for the last couple of weeks, because once I was fired, I refused to leave the country. I had my own passport, and I didn't let this company basically push me around. And uh, I put up a bit of a fight at that time, and tried to do a, a bit of appealing, and wrote an appeal letter, and that was, uh, 
uh, another cause for a thorn in their side. So I guess um, that's kind of where that part ended in Sarajevo. I then uh, was given the, the good name of Karen to uh, find. I found Karen and she then found Stephanie, or I'm not really sure how that all <laughs> happened to this day, but we all got together somehow. <laughs> and uh, at that point in time, turned everything over to them and they helped me through this. Um, I didn't realize until I was fired that my contract was governed under the laws of the United Kingdom. I was hired in, <laughs> I was hired in the U.S. by what I thought was a U.S. company representing our U.S. State Department. I thought I was working for the U.S. So then when I'm fired, the fine print says, by the way, <coughs> governed in the laws of England, I think it said. So now what do I do? <laughs> and so that was the dilemma. And um, I wound up coming here and fighting the case. And to be honest, I'm still not sure if I did the right thing, because sometimes I think had I somehow filed something in the US as well, that potentially more publicity could have been given to this early on, because a separate case was being fought at the same time, which came to my attention later. Another man by the name of Ben Johnston, who also worked for Nine Core, the same company. The year before, and I believe his case started in 1998, had been reporting this also to Dine Corps officials, only he was under a Defense Department contract. I was under a Department of State contract. So he actually had a videotape that had been circulated of a girl being raped on the base um, by Dine Corps managers. And he had actually uh, gone to the US military, CID, to try and get help because he felt that um, his life was also in danger and they wound up taking him in protective custody. And, that's all outlined in the in the book as well, but long story short, his attorney got in touch with Karen and we, I was actually jointly, we were doing some talking back and forth. I was gonna testify in that case in the US, which uh, happened to be taking place around the same time that my case was coming to the tribunal here. And I believe the day that the, the uh, case was won, that we won our case, I was actually July 27th, which was my birthday. I was scheduled to testify in his case in the US which I was very happy about, great birthday present. And then when I called uh, Mr. Glasheen, the attorney, to really let him know that we'd won the case, he, and ask him when I expect, when I kind of expect to be there, he said basically within hours of settling the case here, or me winning the case, they had settled out of court in the States. And not only that, but it was for a undisclosed amount of money with a gag order. So at that point in time, it was dead, and I knew it, and I really felt bad because I really, really wanted more publicity in the U.S. about this. And it's clear to me that this company, uh, that's really part of their game, is to be under the radar, so to speak, and to make sure that the American public and our, our American government, I'm not so naive to think that the government doesn't know what's going on, because I know they do know, but it's nice to have um, a cover for that. And so as long as DynCorp can be the cover, and these contractors for any kind of things that they don't want to get out, that's nice to have an escape coat. So that still kind of irritates me, and if any of you have any ideas about how <laughs> I can pursue this further <laughs> in the U.S., let me know, because I'm, I'm enraged. Um, just this week, this last week, I found out, after now four or five years, when I thought things might be settling down, since my book, my book came out in the U.S. Uh, a few weeks before it came out here in the U.K., and I've now been contacted by several of the uh, monitors who I worked with there, also fellow police office, officers from the US, who were my friends, who were my colleagues, but who were a bit afraid to speak out of, at the time. They knew what was happening, but they didn't quite know how bad it was. And to be quite honest, they weren't willing to testify in my trial for fear of reprisals and losing their job as well, which I understood. Uh, one gentleman in particular, emailed me last week apologizing after he read the book for not being more supportive and really I could tell felt horrible and proceeded to tell me that two other individuals both of whom were actually involved in the tribunal hearings one was there and gave testimony and was found to be an unreliable witness by the tribunal panel and the other was actually implicated by Madeline Reese as being caught coming out of a brothel um, after I left Bosnia and he was at that time let go, let's call it, 
and forced to sign some kind of a UN document that he'd never serve in another UN mission. Uh, the, these two gentlemen I've found were uh, re-employed by DynCor and serving in Kyrgyzstan in 2004 and 2005, according to this gentleman. So that really, really bothers me to think that a company um, doesn't even care enough about their own credibility who claim they've changed their corporate culture, or let alone all the other incidents that they've been involved in the past 10 years that have been highly publicized, um, to think that they've hired these guys who really bought, brought discredit to them. I mean, they talked about me, and these guys lied on the stand, found to be unreliable, and had mug shots of themselves, you know, posted all over the UK and were involved in very, very questionable activities before even becoming, becoming the mission. They served in two of the highest positions in the mission, deputy, uh, deputy commissioner, which means they were in charge of every single international police officer. They were two Americans. One was, a, one was a former Orange County, California deputy sheriff. The other was from Aurora, Colorado. Both had held high-level positions in their home cities. Both went into the mission as DICOR employees and took UN high-level positions in the IPTF. And both have been involved in previous lawsuits in their home countries where they had been liable for multi multi-million dollar settlements um, relating to, what would you call it, um, not violence against women, but um, harassment. harassment, yeah, uh, female harassment on their forces. And these were publicized cases, yet DynCorp, who so supposedly is doing background checks on these people, are allowing these men to go into the mission and represent us um, overseas and to be standing up giving speeches about, you know, what good they're doing there. So that's the kind of activity that's been taking place with DynCor for the past 10 years. They're not real happy about the book and the movie coming out, obviously. They've made internal um, memos out and sent them out to their, to their internal employees, which I've also been forwarded by some of my buddies. And so I have that, and uh, then this information coming out about the other guys. And the people who were actually involved in my termination were never fired by DynCor. Um, they continued to work for DynCor. They were promoted up in the ranks and given uh, high-level management positions all over the world in different missions. So that's kind of how DynCor changed. Uh, they changed their name a couple of times, I think, and uh, publicly said that, um, yes, they think human trafficking is really important and very important to investigate this and applaud, <laughs> applaud my work on human trafficking. But I think once they read the book, if anybody ever does to, from that company, which I doubt they will because clearly they never read the tribunal uh, decisions, um, they'll find that this book really is not just about human trafficking. It's about much more. And it's about the internal corruption and the accountability of, of DynCorp and companies just like them. And, for me, uh, now, human trafficking, as Stephanie said, is extremely important to me, but that's never actually been my focus. It happened to be what I was investigating in Bosnia. It's not that that was my only specialty and not what I certainly wanted to do the rest of my life. I want to support all those people out there and those organizations who are doing good public relations work. But my mission, I think, and my focus has to be on law change, <coughs> at least for my home country, and making sure that uh, <clears throat> somehow we can get some some body, some some teeth in arresting these uh, contractors overseas because right now the Department of Defense and the military have some teeth with some of those laws, the Military Extraterritorial Jurisdiction Act and um, of course the Military Code of Justice, but that's only for certain bodies that fall under those. The State Department, which doesn't fall under either of those jurisdictions, basically there's nothing right now that can be done. And in my book I mentioned the CEGEL law, uh, which was introduced into Congress last year, uh, which is the Civilian Extraterritorial Ju Jurisdiction Act. And that would actually give some teeth to the Department of Justice to investigate, to arrest outside the borders of the U.S. and to go after these people who commit felonies overseas. It also would extend um, a lot of things like being able to make changes in the law if indeed it became ineffective. And once again, that unfortunately only got as far as committee and then time ran out in Congress, a new Congress comes in, so these uh, new laws need to be reintroduced again. And I'm, I'm hoping that something can be done to get that law back into place and work on that over the next two years to potentially get something done that way.